Before we get into this, just a little bit of a warning for you. Wonder Egg Priority is unlike anything I've talked about previously on Octo's Corner. It represents, for better or for worse, a great deal of sensitive topics and explores how those living in Japanese society deal with them, in large part through the use of metaphorical storytelling and fantastical settings. This includes, but is not limited to, the subjects of suicide, euthanasia, the morality of cloning, emotional and physical abuse, and mental health. Viewer discretion is advised. What you're looking at right now is just an egg. There's no inherent meaning to it. There's no flavor other than exactly what you imagine raw egg tastes like, and there's no substance to it other than its own natural components. It is, however, not an egg that anyone is ever going to suspect will hatch. You can't use it to make primordial monster beings, and it isn't going to become a chicken someday. It's simply going to be an egg, until I decide to cook it up and eat it, or spread it raw over a nice hot bowl of rice. In that way, it almost seems fake, despite the fact that I know it isn't. It's exactly as I said, it's only an egg. Today we're going to talk a lot about eggs. Not the kind you eat, but the kind which grow embryos inside of them and eventually hatch. Except unlike the kind laid by chickens, there is nothing natural about any of what you're about to see. These aren't bird eggs, they're something more artificial. They blur the line between realities and are the definition of suffering in the vile events which they bring about. This is not a video about natural eggs. This is a video about wonder eggs. Wonder Egg Priority has suffered one of the most jarring public backlashes of any series I have ever seen. From its initial praises being sung from every angle imaginable to what has been labeled publicly as a dumpster fire by almost every major influencer in the industry. And all of this happened almost overnight with the release of the series' final episode. So, what happened? A few things, the odd episode delay, bizarre recap episode that came out of nowhere, one or two public apologies from the series director, very familiar stuff if you were around during the era of Darling and the Franks' fall from grace a few years back. In fact, this whole cycle feels incredibly familiar if you've been watching anime for a while. A show begins, everyone loves it, and then, perhaps under the weight of its own ambitions, it cracks. And the ugly insides of some of the most horrible content in animation history greet the world as the fanbase laments yet another loss of potential. But unlike those other projects, I don't believe Wonder Egg Priority is the next Darling in the Franks or Sword Art Online. It isn't perfect, mind you, but it isn't as bad as you've been told, at least not for the reasons that you've been told it's bad. No, Wonder Egg's problems lie deeper than any of that, but in order to get to them, it's important to understand what Wonder Egg Priority is actually about. Much like a real egg is rich with nutrients, Wonder Egg Priority is rich with detail. And part of the process of actually making sense of that detail involves cracking through the shell, as it were. From where you're sitting right now, this is just an egg. And this is just a show. But the thing is, in the right hands, an egg can become something other than just an egg. It's an ingredient with which to create a culinary masterpiece. The question then is, Given that I have little to no experience with this, what exactly can I make out of it? October 24th, 1988. Audiences all throughout Japan tune in to watch the premiere of Kimiga Uso Otsuita, a new drama penned by a no-name screenwriter with no prior training or experience whose work is about to turn heads the country over. His name is Shinji Nojima, and between now and December 19th, his first official TV drama is going to run for nine episodes before netting him the Fuji TV Award for Television Screenwriting, based on a special contest the company happens to be running for new screenwriters. Nojima's life is never going to be the same. Years prior, the young man had been employed in Aomori Prefecture at a canning plant, where he decided that this type of work would simply never be his thing. To Shinji Nojima, this life of toil needed to be escaped if he was ever to find happiness. That he needed to make something of a difference, if he could. He needed a way to leave his mark on the world. And as luck would have it, writing turned out to be it. I had to find my way of establishing my own identity. If it hadn't been screenwriting, it might well have been something else. 
His success on that first project would eventually lead the then 28-year-old writer to get his first real taste of fame from his work on a project called 101 Proposals. And from there, Nojima continued to release local hits of all forms and build up a reputation within Japan as a notable young force of writing talent. It hadn't been easy, of course, his lack of training had caused him to wind up with more than his fair share of garbage scripts and crumpled up papers. But as Japan's society began to change in the early 90s alongside the rapidly bursting economic bubble, Nojima felt it was time to take a risk on his work. 1993's Koko Kyoshi was not universally acclaimed by everyone who saw it. Not even remotely so. Its controversial depictions of high school violence reflected a society that, at that point in time, shuddered at the thought of such topics. It is, however, among Nojima's best work, and for all the controversy, one of his most profitable as well. To date, the original project has been remade at least two times, to varying levels of success, though none have come close to the impact that the 1993 original had. This was the point where the types of works Nojima would become known for began to emerge. The Japanese society was his canvas, and using his screenwriting as a brush, Nojima would come to paint incredible pictures that were unafraid to call out the country's most taboo of topics. In 2019, he would use animation as his medium of choice for the first time, though it wouldn't be until January 13th, 2021, that his vision would finally be shared with the world. Over the course of this video series, yes, I did say series, unless you're watching the supercut um, of all the videos together, I, I, I'm ruining the pacing of the video by talking about this. A anyway, over the course of this video series, we're going to uncover the creation story of that 2021 anime series bit by bit. And at the same time, we'll be analyzing the visual language of the series, along with various other creative decisions made along the way, to uncover the actual story and artistic intent behind Wonder Egg Priority itself. And of course, once all of that is finished, and perhaps here or there along the way, I'm going to be reviewing the series based on what my analysis uncovers. Hopefully, once everything is said and done, you'll see all of this as more than just another bad egg. I'm Octo, and I think it's time to start looking at Wonder Egg Priority a lot closer. Let's get started. Any first episode of a series is going to be a big talking point in terms of analysis, because more than any other episode, the first episode is the one which has to do the most heavy lifting. In Wonder Egg's case, all that density in terms of detail and social commentary needs to be accepted by the audience right away so that the remainder of the series can get itself underway. And because I lack the lexicon to properly explain what I mean by that without completely breaking apart the contents of Episode 1, Episode 1 is going to take a bit longer to explain than most of the episodes which follow it. In other words, it's going to take a while to cover Episode 1. But it's also imperative that it take that long because if any of these details are skimmed over for the sake of time or brevity, None of what happens later on in the series is going to make any sense. Let's start by asking a simple question then. At the beginning of episode one, a girl stops in the middle of the street to pick up what looks like a dying firefly, right? After being nearly hit by a car, she carefully gives the poor creature a grave nearby. The question then is, why exactly would a person do this? More specifically, why exactly would this particular person do it? As it turns out, this is not a simple question. This isn't a quirky character trait of hers. We know from later on that this girl that we're seeing here is not typically a fan of bugs. If you pay attention to the way she moves, however, understanding her state of mind starts to become fairly easy to do. Listless, almost dead looking, she isn't thinking about anything in her immediate surroundings right now. She's looking for something, for meaning perhaps. Standing in the street, an individual is lost and looking for direction. She's clearly in a mental state where she's waiting to find a message meant for her, whatever form that message may take. Maybe this girl didn't think she'd come home. Maybe she thinks there's nothing for her to come home to. Any other person would just see a dying firefly, but this girl isn't thinking like any other person. This girl is looking for something to convince her not to die. In that kind of mindset, this bug isn't just another bug at all. It's an objective marker. A yellow jacket from behind, immediately the word caution comes to mind. But a sunflower on the front becomes visible as she turns to face the unwelcome light. These blossoms are commonly confused to mean joy, but in the language of flowers there are two commonly accepted meanings for sunflowers. The first is an unwavering admiration and loyalty. 
something repeat viewings will shed new light on, as a question of loyalty is arguably what led to the tragedy that this girl now mourns. The second, more speculative meaning, is arguably the most relevant of the two in this context, albeit for completely different reasons. In Victorian floral arrangements, the presence of a sunflower is meant to reference the empty promise of false riches, a sinister truth behind an innocent-looking blossom. Caution, indeed. Then there's the car, the car with Google Maps clearly visible from the view of the inside we get in this shot. This is not a normal thing to emphasize. And in that fact, we can determine that there must be something of value to gain from its presence, right? Why show it this way? Simple. It's to emphasize that the girl we see before us is directionless, but the driver is not. I rest my case, this girl is looking for meaning. The glowing bug is a checkpoint marker. She wouldn't normally do this, but the girl picks it up and gives it a grave. This is considered good manners in most cultures, but in Japanese storytelling, particularly within the realm of anime, I've noticed that it's accumulated more of a commentative meaning. It's used in multiple series, but its use is meant to denote something out of the ordinary, or someone out of the ordinary. Nobody notices the dead animal, everybody passes by, but the right thing to do is bury it, right? It's a deep-seated metaphor for the way Japanese society typically views social issues or problematic occurrences that may be happening nearby. Bury the cat, so to speak, and you take care of the problem. Be the one who helps, not the one who passes by. The same moral found in the story of the Good Samaritan, which is commonly retold in Christian sects. But there's actually two sides to this story. In Nekomonogatari Black, we see an examination of the other side. Tsubasa Hanikawa buries the cat, and the cat comes back to haunt her. In other words, by taking care of others, you're also making them your problem. Their problem is solved, but yours no longer is. So just as often as the right thing to do is simply the right thing to do, and that's all there is to it, the aftermath of doing that, of noticing the problem and choosing to do something about it, can lead to it growing much more complex and involved in your life than you may have wanted when you chose to stop and help. Therefore, the fact that the quote-unquote bug begins talking and immediately complications arise makes perfect sense in this scenario. This part of the metaphor is more or less the same across all variations of the story of burying the cat, so to speak. The grave is empty. The grave is empty. The cat is now your problem. This is the significance of the car honking at her. The car has a set path to follow. The girl does not. So... Rather than a simple, get out of the street, stupid, like most honks in media imply, this one says something slightly different. It's as if the driver is trying to say, get out of my way, I have my own problems to deal with. Comparisons to Nekomonogatari actually deepen when you realize that both instances prey on the mental needs of those involved by changing the context of that need and solving it through immoral or impractical means. Hanakawa by fighting fire with fire, so to speak, violence killing her parents who hit her, when all she actually needed was validation and a sense of familial belonging. Oto fighting to save and make friends with people who have already died or who are equally suicidal instead of actually going to school or building lasting friendships with living people. Okay, let's take a look at the bug itself, shall we? The bug moves robotically, but the girl does not. This is deliberate, not an animation trick done to save money. Other animation tricks to save money are done later in the series, but none of those, aside from the obvious ones that all Japanese animation projects employ, are used in this episode, so we can reasonably assume this jagged movement means something. Next, we have the girl's name. Otoai. In Romaji, Otoai's name is spelled with two letters. A-I. Artificial intelligence. Just like we find out this robotic insect is when it in fact leaves the grave and speaks. Just like a quest marker or important item in a game, the bug is a lure to trick those chosen few who are in a position to bury the cat, as it were, to make it their problem. Remember this fact, it will come back later. This adds even more context to the car from earlier. Both I and the driver are being guided by artificial intelligence, being given direction and led down certain paths without even thinking about it. So whatever it is that built this bug, wants to lure in people who care about helping what's already dead. 
The common theme so far seems to be blurred lines between artificial intelligence and organic life. Opposites that, once you think about it, aren't actually opposites at all. This is reflected in Otto's eyes. One blue, one yellow. They seem opposite, and you probably remember them as being opposite colors, but they actually aren't. The opposite of yellow is purple, not blue. The opposite of organic life is death, not artificial intelligence. But the more you think about artificial life and testing with it, the more you have to think about what life is to begin with. Just like how for years, the argument over the color indigo continues to be whether it's a shade of purple or blue. The line between dead and artificially undead blurs. The line between blue and purple blurs. The morality of using the dead to test an AI is no longer so crisp and clear, and as we continue to follow AI toward innovation, we keep putting our trust in our technology without stopping to think about whether or not the place that AI leads us to is actually the right place to go. Just like how I follows the bug with a sense of childlike curiosity, only beginning to doubt its guidance once she's already too far in to make a choice about whether she wants to go or not. All this has been foreshadowed within the first three minutes. All of it becomes important in the series' final episodes. Trust me, we'll get there eventually. Even the environmental lighting is hammering this point home. Day and night are opposites. The sky, however, is showing us neither. Instead, we get the exact middle ground. Not exactly bright as day, not exactly dark as night, either. A perfectly blurred mixture of the two, making it impossible to tell on a first viewing if the light in the very first shot is fading or brightening until we see it from a different angle. According to the visual language, this is what Wonder Egg Priority is telling us it's going to be. A conversation about the differences and similarities between life, death, and artificial intelligence. This is our series thesis statement, if you want to call it that. Immediately after the pieces of that statement fall into place, we abruptly cut to black. This, too, is deliberate. It didn't fade or match cut or do anything like that to imply the metaphors of the previous scene are going to be continuing over to this one. It's the show using its visual direction to say, hey, stop thinking about those ideas, let's put those on hold for now, and let's look at something new. A direct cut like this is pretty clearly trying to differentiate between the intent of the visuals, meaning that what comes next is going to be different. We've had abrupt and sudden cuts before, so the only tool left in the visual language lexicon to communicate this change in intent is by cutting to black completely, which is why that's exactly what happens. How do we confirm this? Again, with visuals rather than words. Immediately after that abrupt cut to black, we just as abruptly cut to another metaphorical establishing shot. So uh, real quick, establishing shots are meant to give the audience context on setting, right? But in this series, the setting is going to change a lot and the backgrounds have already been shown to enhance what is being established rather than establish points for themselves. This is not always the case in visual media, but it is here, and the director has been very deliberate in the cold open to show us that. In other words, Wonder Egg uses establishing shots just like any other series, but it also uses metaphorical establishing shots. Shots where characters don't immediately move and give us time to get a good look at them first. By opening the next scene with this kind of shot, we can actually get a feel for what the imagery of the next scene is going to be conveying based on the very first frame. Same character as before, Otoai, but now she's not wearing her hoodie anymore. We can see much more of her actual body, and we're inside as opposed to outside. This is to signify that the metaphors which were being presented in the thesis of the cold open are no longer the focus. Instead, it's time to look beyond the surface level, or broad idea from before, and hone in on what's inside. Instead of seeing what I stands for, now we get to see more of the real her, which is reflected by the difference in the amount of skin you can see in frame compared to before. This subconsciously conveys to the audience how much of I's character they can reasonably hope to understand in the scene. This is about what's inside the hoodie the person. The fact that the background tells us that we're inside of a house again reaffirms the point from earlier that the backgrounds in Wonder Egg Priority back up the metaphors that the focal points and main characters are presenting. They are separate things doing separate tasks. 
This type of metaphorical significance may be lost on you if you're used to 3D CGI animation or live action film, but while all forms of visual media use layering to an extent, in 2D animation specifically, each piece of the set actually exists separately with moving characters never physically being a part of the background by virtue of requiring to move. This actually goes back to how cell animation is created in the first place. Even moving elements of the background require their own layer and cell in the photography stage. This is why it is acceptable for these two to be metaphorically considered separate storytelling devices and analyzed as such. They literally have to be created separately as separate pieces of art, which support each other in order to tell the story. So we've established now that instead of looking at the world and making a statement about the society within it, instead this scene is going to be character driven. So what exactly do we need to know about Oto Ai as a character? Let's find out. She could walk outside, but she doesn't. She only walks outside when there's nobody else around, and when there actually was somebody else around, she didn't actually seem happy to see them. Combine that with the lack of other people in the shot, and suddenly I feel very confident in saying that Oto Ai is antisocial. Additionally, the amount of abrupt cuts to different angles, activities, and rooms implies that she stays inside for a longer period of time than most people would. The slow, laid-back nature implies that she probably isn't going to go to school, and for that matter doesn't have much of anywhere to go in any sort of hurry. When she takes a bath and after the fact still isn't wearing anything that your typical Japanese person would probably wear outside of the house, it becomes clear that she isn't going to school, furthering the notion that she is antisocial. Throughout all of this, the only actual exterior shot we get doesn't actually tell us anything about where we physically are. It does, however, foreshadow her family dynamic by showing one fish quickly hiding from view or interaction, representing I herself, while the other fish stays confidently in the light, unafraid of being seen like I's mother. There are two fish total and two family members. In fact, I doesn't seem to enjoy being in light at all preferring instead to stay in the shadowed parts of the shot wherever possible. There's not anything definitive to say about that for now, but it is interesting that the shadow imagery only seems to intensify shortly after the fish shot occurs, almost emphasizing the point that was being made in this moment about light and shadow. It's possible that it's meant to represent that she doesn't enjoy attention, the car's headlights from earlier acting as sort of spotlights, and eyes expression conveying everything else. But again, there's nothing here that can be considered 100% definitive. It is, however, an interesting contrast because I is human, but prefers to hide in the shadows while the actual AI is hidden in the shadows, but longs to be allowed in the light. And once again, it's a very clever way of contrasting the not quite opposites, like we discussed before, even before those not quite opposites have been made aware of each other or even introduced to the audience. Note, uh, we also get to see her in her room, labeled I, which is written in katakana, not hiragana, further connecting it with the English term AI, as katakana is used almost exclusively as a way of writing borrowed or foreign words. You'll notice that up until now, we haven't actually spoken at all about the dialogue, but it's at this point where that aspect starts becoming important. That's not to say it wasn't before, but it goes twofold from this point on. We can always go back to earlier dialogue later to emphasize concepts as they arise, but if I go over it now, this video will never end. So let's just say that starting now, I'm going to start explaining the dialogue too. Ai's teacher drops by her house on the regular, it seems, based on the conversation, but Ai is determined to avoid either him or her mother, one of the two. Until we see her on screen with one or the other, we can assume it's both. I, literally and metaphorically in the dark about what's happening outside her door, tries to ignore thoughts of her teacher by turning her thoughts again back to the egg. Speaking of the egg, isn't it fantastic how the very next shot after talking about eating the egg is a shot of the egg being eaten? It tricks us for a split second before proving us wrong when I continues to talk about the egg while eating a regular egg. We also know it's more durable than a regular egg because of this moment. A regular egg breaks, here's proof. Into it. <coughs> Back to the shot. This scene is perfect because of reasons we'll get into later. Just remember that she's literally and metaphorically in the dark about what's happening outside the door for right now. Let's confirm the thought from earlier real quick. Okay, cool. Alright, so as we soon find out, leaving home at night, or as the dialogue and backgrounds hint at, early in the morning, is a common Oto-Ai practice. 
but obviously she isn't going to end up in the usual spot. The smooth transition in the background implies that this is still going to be introspective, but the framing of Ai as the one who stands out also tells us that it isn't going to be introspective about her. The flower in the foreground, by the way, is also important. It's a white lily, which symbolizes purity, but most commonly, it's associated with funerals because of that. Mix that with the broken looking background from a moment ago and we have a common theme being called back to, paying attention to death and being the outlier in that. We can also confirm something else based on a combination of dialogue and animation here. This world is not a dream. The only other time thus far that I has proved to herself that something wasn't a dream was with the egg itself. You'll remember she initially thought it was a dream. <laughs> But we can also infer that this isn't quite reality either, thanks to what the bugs said before. So if it isn't real, and it isn't a dream either, it's either a hallucination or a simulation. Thus far, I hasn't touched anything except for herself. We're gonna pretend like I didn't just say that and instead choose to word that much better than I did. So the moment it's proven that she can interact with something tangible in this environment, we can also conclude that this is a simulation or is in some way related to computers or AI. I think it's pretty obvious by now what the next couple of scenes are going over in terms of metaphorical imagery, especially if you've seen the show recently. But I actually believe that this first encounter, while not necessarily bad, is at the very least narratively misleading on a first viewing and can very easily set you up to be disappointed by the finale. Let me quickly explain why that is in case me saying that confuses you. Most people seem to think that I and the person she meets in the egg world during this adventure suffer from the same problem. And they have every reason to think that bullying is the reason I is antisocial and refuses to go to school. In fact, based on how she reacts, you could easily misunderstand what's happening here as a PTSD-induced nightmare. The only hint at what's actually going on is the previously mentioned white lily and its distance from I. The lily is inside the class, I is outside, which means that she's an outsider in this world looking inward. The important thing to remember here is that I did not get bullied. I mean, she did get bullied, but not to this extent. That isn't at all why she's antisocial, is my point, and it isn't what she's struggling with, as we find out later on in the very same episode. She's not reacting to the bullying itself, she's reacting to the literal faceless hellspawn who are doing it and the strange voices saying terrible things on the loudspeaker. This fear is literal, not metaphorical. I is an outsider who is, who is visiting the internal fears of someone who has already died, someone who died because they were getting bullied. This is their hellscape, not hers, and we can prove that based on what happens next. Oh, and just for good measure, bathroom and toilet interaction, so we have that pointing to simulation. And of course, talking toilet paper, which seems weird until you know whose voice it is and what they're doing. <laughs> We can have further proof based on a conversation that happens in just a moment, but for now, let's answer a few questions and also start asking some more too. The Sino Elves represent bullying, and they're being guided along by these freaks of nature who have pinpoint accuracy with axes. In other words, the Sino Elves don't have eyes. They don't see the bullying or the level of hurt that the bullies cause. They just laugh along. They aren't the perpetrators, but they aren't innocent either. The actual perpetrators are the only ones who actively are shown hurting. Uh, name? What, what was her name? Name? But they do it from the distance. They throw axes as a metaphor for throwing words. So there are the perpetrators and those who simply laugh along. It's such a simple metaphor, in fact, that the series expects you to figure them out immediately. <laughs> You shouldn't have to think about this particular metaphor. It isn't supposed to be important. Now that that's settled though, I have several questions. Namely, why does Kudami know about the simulation? If something comes along later, we'll answer this. But if it doesn't, that's a plot hole. She actually seems incredibly familiar with this entire system already and says as long as eyes heart and eyes remain intact, she's immortal in this world, which is, as she puts it, 
You could actually make the argument that since this girl is really familiar with how this all works and she wears an egg shaped earring, that she's been through this whole system multiple times, which may be true given her visual similarities to another character, but I don't currently have any evidence on that, so we're just going to move on for now. Do not worry though, we will be back on this subject later. Oh, also, she says this, and it isn't wrong to apply that idea to the rest of the series, but it also is not the point of the entire series either. It's just insight into this particular character's viewpoint, though, like anything with talent behind its writing, it is going to be something that gets called back to later on, once or twice. A surprising amount of people took this statement here and ran with it, which is unfortunate because it isn't actually as integral to the point of the series as you might think, though it is incredibly profound, as well as extremely applicable to gotcha games and other free-to-play experiences. Hit the link in the description. The girl here is also shown to be wrong about other things too though, like when she says that I wouldn't have broken the egg if she had friends, when in fact she only broke the egg on accident when she threw it at the toilet paper man to try and get him to stop yelling at her. She threw it as sort of a defensive reflex, if you will. Hatching a friend, as it were, was not at all what she was attempting to do, though in the grand scheme of Wonder Egg priority, this assumption is more or less true in a sort of meta sense. This girl is the follow-up to the Cursed Cat comparison, by the way. I made Kudumi her problem by choice at first, and now wants nothing more than to get rid of the problem entirely. It's worn out its welcome, if you will. So, instead of putting herself in harm's way to save the dead cat and give it a grave, she just lets the Sino Elves go right past her because they don't attack her on their own. Only the perpetrators do. Sorry, I just, I really enjoy using that clip. The animation is just really good and the musical timing and stuff, it's, it's, it's freaking awesome. Okay, but where were we? Oh yeah. Again on her own, I walks with a multicolored pen. This is a good time to point out that a lot of her color design is meant to call back to a pencil case or children's coloring book. Art, in other words. So her weapon being a pen is just to kind of finalize that point, which is accurate because art is the root of Ai's problem, and it's the reason she's antisocial. Same as how the other girl's weapons are metaphors for their own issues, which again, we'll get into that later. These flowers, messed up and abandoned on the floor, are synonymous with Buddhist funeral floral arrangements, so death and the fact that they've been dropped on the floor is a metaphor for Ai abandoning Kurumi in the previous scene. The door is a common way of expressing a change or gateway between two worlds, so I going through it changes the narrative focus to be more self-centered and main character focused because she's abandoning the needs of others, as it were, and that idea is confirmed by what happens next on the roof. That's why it makes perfect sense to put a flashback here, where, just like we discussed, bullying is not the problem. I bullies herself more than anyone else bullies her. Granted, she does get bullied, like I said, or at least she claims she does, but the way she carries herself implies that she beats herself up over it more than other people do. So if I'd have to guess, I'd say that bullying probably came from elementary school and has simply haunted her ever since. Notice how I views the character of Koito, emotionless somehow, unreadable regardless of her expression. Very few other characters have this kind of design and this deliberately ambiguous facial expression. It's almost hollow, isn't it? Note, uh, this will be important later, so do not forget it. This is the world of Wonder Egg Priority. Horrific imagery is not censored or hidden. It isn't even treated with any sort of sensitivity. It just is. I do not care for this way of doing things. I understand that it's the motif, but I have issues with it that go way beyond understanding or not understanding the way suicide is depicted in Wonder Egg Priority and the reasons for doing it that way. We will get into what those are very soon. For now though, Let's go back to Koito. Koito doesn't give up on the girl who gave up on herself. And when she drops by Ai's house later on to return the umbrella and the bag, we get to see the fruits of that labor pay off. Friendship and a change in perspective. We don't get to know all the details just yet, but the main issue is that Oto Ai blames herself for the death of Koito. It's why she sits near to the monument and honors Koito's memory. But alongside that self-reflection comes a sort of realization. 
What happened to Koito could happen to anyone. And if it really was her fault, then if she doesn't help Kurumi, that will be her fault too. You'll notice a distinct difference between these two rooftops once Kurumi shows up again. It would be easy to just stand by and watch it all go down. Simple, in fact. But Oto Ai isn't afraid like she was before. When she states that a crosswalk is still scary even when you're moving with the crowd, she's actually saying something incredibly profound that can be taken as the solution to the issue of bullying, according, of course, to Wonder Egg Priority. Life is scary no matter who you are, or what path you walk down. Just because you fit in doesn't make it any more or less scary. And that being the case, why choose the side that hurts others if it doesn't make things any easier? Why pretend not to see? Nobody has to be a Sino elf. And the moment Oto Ai realizes this, the gap is bridged. And the one person who doesn't laugh along with the rest speaks out against the, the perpetrator. The bullying stops. Uh. <laughs> And yet, this still isn't quite right, is it? Now, I'm sure based on everything we've analyzed so far, you have questions, just like any rational viewer would. There's a lot about this whole thing that still doesn't make sense just yet, isn't there? Well, I recommend getting comfortable, maybe grabbing a snack or two, maybe even cooking up some eggs if you feel like it, because there's a lot to unpack about what happens next. You may think that we've covered a lot of ground so far with episode 1, but if I'm being completely honest with you, we haven't even cracked the shell. Okay, thank you for watching part 1 of a multi-part Wonder Egg Priority video. I know, doing a whole multi-part thing is kinda lame. I get it, I said I would cover it completely, and I stand by that. I will. <laughs> if anything, I hope that this analysis of just episode 1 has been kind of reassuring, because eventually I do plan on doing multiple parts. In fact, um, the script right now is 21 pages long. <laughs> um, I currently have seven parts planned um, for this series total. So seven videos of roughly the same length as this one, just going in about as much detail. Um, not all of them will go into quite as much shot by shot, frame by frame detail, but because it's episode one, it's important to establish the main formula and stuff. So thank you so much for bearing with me on this one. Um, and maybe putting up with a bit more of a hyperactive focus um, than you would otherwise see. Eventually, I'll make a super cut of all the parts put together, and it'll just be like one big three-hour video essay on Wonder Egg Priority that hopefully will be um, all-inclusive and definitive and exhaustive. Um, so, yeah. You can wait for that if you'd like, but I, I would definitely appreciate it if you watched all the parts as they come out. Um, I can't promise that the next video, the very next video that's going up is going to be part two of this, but I can promise you um, that I am already working on part two. I'm just also working on a few other projects. Um, definitely uh, a, a new We Cross video, which again might take a little bit longer before it, it's ready to come out. Um, and yeah. Oh, by the way, before I forget, thank you so much for 100 plus subscribers, 115 as of the time of me recording this. That is amazing. I did not expect that. And also, the obscene amount of views <laughs> that the Hibane Renme video got. I I don't actually think that video is very good. I, I, I don't know why people like it so much. Um, but thank you, regardless, for watching. You guys have really made a difference in my life, just giving me something to do um, during an especially difficult time. Um, so thank you so much. You guys have no idea how much the kind comments and just everything you guys have been doing means. Um, especially all of you guys who requested and patiently waited for me to make this video. Uh, again, more is coming relatively soon, but don't expect it to just be one after the other right in a row. Um, I do have some other projects I'm, uh, wanting to work on right now, um, but I am still chipping away at Wonder Egg Priority. It's just such a long project that doing it all at once um, would be tantamount to suicide. So um, thank you for hanging in there. I will see you guys in the next video. And uh, yeah, thank you. Hope you have a wonderful day. I'm Octo, and I'm signing out.